super unplanned video coming at you right now. Shut up and sit down. I am doing a collab with a bunch of other awesome people called the best stories in video games collaboration. Can you tell I'm underprepared and over enthusiastic? All right, so basically, um, this is a collab where a bunch of us are talking about the storytelling in some of our favorite video games, and we've all chosen different video games that we're going to talk about. And yeah, that's basically it. I'll link everyone else who's in the collab down below. The video games that I have chosen for today's video are Fable 3 and Assassin's Creed 2. Um, technically, they are my some of my favourite games, but the pool from which I am choosing favourites is very small. <laughs> so basically, they're just two of the most recent video games that I have actually played all the way through, which I guess makes them a favourite because I actually stuck with them the entire way through. If I didn't enjoy it, I probably wouldn't have kept playing it. So yeah, there's that. I don't play a lot of video games. Not because I don't like playing video games. I do. I just get really sucked in and addicted really easily. So... I will spend several weeks where the only thing I am doing in any of my spare time is just playing that game and it's really not that great because I have a ton of creative projects that I want to be working on and if I'm playing a video game the entire time I'm not working on any of those so I do try to limit them but I will sometimes fall down the rabbit hole for a couple of weeks and play something new. Today, as I mentioned, the two video games I'm doing is Fable 3 and Assassin's Creed 2. Um, I'm just going to break down some of the things I liked about them and also some of the things I didn't like about them. The storyline for Fable 3 is kind of like a, a revolution sort of thing. You are the prince or princess, you get to choose which gender you are, I think. And you've got to overthrow your tyrannical brother, basically. You have to go gather a bunch of supporters and do a heap of things. And then you get to the end and you do this big battle and then you take over. There's also a lot of like politics-based stuff in there, which is really cool. So you have to make... Uh, you have like a moral standing sort of thing and... Dis all decisions that you make of like how you interact with people in the world will either make you more good or evil and it will affect your aura but if you want to make all the good decisions it costs a lot of money because you've got to like renovate the city and do all these lovely things for everyone but at the same time you start out with no money so you have to spend ages trying to like build up all of your money to be able to do all that so that takes a long time. Whereas if you don't mind about being like relatively corrupted and having a really red aura, <laughs> then you can do things like turn an orphanage into a brothel and punch people in the street. Oh, you can kick chickens, <laughs> which is terrible. But there's something about the way that they've done it in the game. It just makes this like hilarious, but also terrible chicken squawk sound if you kick a chicken. I do not recommend kicking chickens in real life. That is a bad, bad life decision and that it does make your morals go down in the game. But if all the random things to add into the game is all these like random little details of things that you can do that will go towards how you play the game, there's, there's just so many, and that's the details of the storytelling as well. So the overall storytelling is like the story of revolution. And yeah, you basically just get to be a swashbuckling revolutionary 
and complete all of these cool missions. Save people from kidnappers and battle off highwaymen and werewolves and stuff in the forest, which is great. You can also marry more than one person. Oh, this is another great thing I really liked. So all of like the villager random people that you can interact with, you can like start courting them and marry them. And then if they like you, they'll start bringing you gifts in the street. So like, and that's like if the general townspeople like you as well, they start bringing you gifts. Whereas if they don't like you, like if you own all the houses and you make the rent really high, then they start saying really nasty things to you on the street. Um, and it's all like the little details of that that the writers who wrote the game have woven into it and it's really, it's just, I find it so fascinating. But yeah, so that's one of the things I really like about Fable, Fable 3. I know someone else is doing Fable 2 as well, which I haven't played, I haven't played any other, any of the other Fables, so I'm interested to see what their thoughts are on this because I did see somewhere that, like, people comparing the two and saying that Fable 2 was really, like, better. I don't know. I don't know. It's the only one I've played. It was fun. The one thing that I didn't particularly like about the game is that the build-up is really, really long. There's, like, so much detail and everything, and then the ending happens really quickly. And the first time we played it through, because I played it with my housemate, the first time we played it through, we're like, wait, it's over? That was shit. What? We only just got to the good bit of like where you ha can make all these decisions and then it's just done. Once you're the ruler, you can go and complete all the side quests and everything. But when you get to the end bit, there's a heap of uh, decisions you have to make um, and you need a heap of money in the the crown bank thing. So the second time I played it through, because I think I've played it like two or three times, the second time we played it through, we stopped before we did the last few quests and then just spent ages just running around doing all the side quests and building up so that we had heaps and heaps of money in the crown bank so that we could make all the other decisions. Because the first time we was like, well, I guess we're turning this place into a brothel because we don't have enough money and that will bring in more money. It's interesting how they put in the economics of stuff as well. It's very interesting. Like, yes, you can renovate the orphanage, but it will cost you a lot of money and you won't get anything back. Or you can turn it into a brothel. It won't cost you much and you'll get a heap of money off it. So yeah, overall, the story was pretty fun. It was good as well playing it a second time because I was no longer as shit at the controls and I could actually do it without dying all the time. Um, that's another thing as well, the more you die, the more scars and stuff you get. And so the first time through, our character has a massive scar, like, across her face. <laughs> because I just died so many times trying to kill wolves and bandits and stuff. Um, because I am not good at mastering the croc controls. Anything other than button mashing. So yeah, the second time we played it, we got to build up more of the money and basically extend the ending a little bit so that we got to play it for longer, which made it a bit better. But I feel like they could have drawn out the sort of resolution and everything a bit better. I don't know. But then there is the point of, yeah, sometimes you have all this build up and then suddenly it's just like, boom, and the story's done. But... At the same time, when you're creating a story, you want it to have, like, a satisfying ending and feel like the... You want to feel like the conclusion was worth all the build-up. Um, which it did feel like you were getting a little shortchanged at the end. All in all, for Fable 3, I loved how detailed the world-building was and the adventure of the overall storyline, but the ending really sort of ruined it for me. If they had fixed the timeline of the ending so that it didn't jump through some really interesting concepts so quickly and skip hundreds of days at a time, this game would have been really great. Anyway, moving on to Assassin's Creed 2, which I should actually remember more details from because I played it maybe a month or two ago. I really like this game. One of the reasons I really like this game is because it's set in the Renaissance and the main character is best friends with Leonardo da Vinci. And I mean, <laughs> it's fucking brilliant. It's so good. 
And I think that was my favourite storyline. I should put a disclaimer, I did spend around 30% of my time playing this game swearing at the screen for a mixture of reasons. Half of which were probably like, oh my god, why are you so dumb, Ezio? Don't do that. Don't trust this person. It won't end well. Oh my god, why did you do it? I told you not to. Basically, the character does not see some of the shit coming that is very obviously coming and it's frustrating because it's decisions that you can't change in the game because I'm just like, no, don't do that! Oh, you did it! Oh god, now I have to deal with the fallout. That sort of thing. And the rest was just because I'm, I'm, I'm really shit at it and I couldn't master the controls and I kept either falling or missing things when I tried to climb, or accidentally jumping off of buildings and dying because I couldn't master the controls properly. Um, yeah, so I, I rage quitted a couple of the missions where I had to do like a obstacle course chase because I kept falling off of the same spot and I couldn't get it. Um, I did finally get it, like, but it probably took me several days of like leaving it I think I got stuck on one mission for like an hour and then I quit and I came back to it a couple of days later and I was like, fine, finally did it. So yeah, that was basically just me not being good at video games. And the whole other thing is like, the, the other reason like Ezio being a dumbass <laughs> is part of the story. So, <laughs> so it's not necessarily bad storytelling. It's kind of good storytelling because it's getting you engaged and you're just like, no! It's like horror movies when you're like, don't go down that corridor and they go down that corridor because it pushes the plot forward. Oh, I did also really suck at like the bit with the pistol. When they introduced like this weird hand pistol thing, I couldn't, I couldn't master it. I got stuck in the tutorial for, I'm not even kidding, like 45 minutes trying to shoot these targets. And I don't know whether it was just me being shit or if the game had glitched, but I, it was one of those tutorials that I couldn't really exit out of. Or I couldn't work out how to exit out of it. And I couldn't finish the tutorial because I couldn't get the targets because I was really bad at it. Yeah, that was interesting. I love you, Leonardo, but that invention wasn't fun. <laughs> and that's the other thing. Anytime Ezio gets like a weapon upgrade or whatever, it's Leonardo's inventions. Like, it's so cute! It's so cute! And, and the two of them, not gonna lie, like, Leonardo da Vinci is very queer-coded in the game, but I appreciate that. I also appreciate how much fanfiction there is for Leonardo da Vinci and Ezio and I'm just like this is brilliant because I was watching the game going I can't be the only person thinking this surely not and then I looked up on AO3 and I was like I wasn't the only person <laughs> And it ranges from really cute, fluffy stuff to very not safe for work, but well written. So I mean, there's that. Overall, I would say the storyline for Assassin's Creed 2 is like pretty, pretty engaging. I really like the Renaissance setting. Um, I really like all like the stabby assassin knives and everything as well. They're really cool. The main overarching story for the series of Assassin's Creed is this bloke called, what is his name? Desmond. So Desmond is like the modern day dude. So Desmond is in modern day and he's like in this weird science program where they're getting, they're unlocking his DNA and finding the stories of his ancestors and he has to relive his ancestors, pre like the previous lives of his ancestors to try and discover secrets that they knew with this whole idea that memories are locked in your DNA. So that's really fascinating and like it's kind of science fiction-y which I'm into. So that's the overarching of like the Assassin's Creed series. This is the second one in the series, so the first one, I can't remember what happened, I did play most of it. 
the second one, they've sort of left the main facility and they're on the run, and so they've like there's like this urgency of like, oh, we've got to get it done really quickly. But then the second storyline of the this game is the uh, the ancestors story, which is Ezio's story, which is the one in the Renaissance. So you're reliving it, but you're deliberately reliving it because Desmond is reliving it at the same time. So really, you're playing Desmond, who's playing Ezio, and then there's yeah, it's really well written, and they had a, they've had a really good team doing Assassin's Creed, and I think this is one of the reasons it's such a popular game and it has done so well is because it is so well written because honestly if the storyline was shit if it's not well written people won't keep playing it and people won't be as engaged and like there's so much there's only so much graphics and visual effects can do to keep you playing a video game in the end i think there needs to be something that makes you want to keep playing and that's something for a lot of these style games is the story if you're comparing the amount of control you have over how the world plays out on the two different games assassin's creed you don't really have that much control because you are reliving a memory so you have to stay synced with the actual storyline of Ezio's story, otherwise it desynchronizes. Whereas Fable, you do have control over it. So Fable, you have like multiple different options of how the world, how you impact the world, of like whether you make it better or worse or anything. So there's multiple different variants and possibilities that you can can control, which are really cool. And that element of control is what I think makes it interesting to play multiple times because there's so many different possibilities. It's very much more along the choose your own adventure storyline, whereas Assassin's Creed is kind of like a um, relive a historical era storyline. Basically both of them you get to run around with a big ass sword, so I'm down. I think that's one of the awesome things about video games is it allows you to live out a different life, which is really cool. I guess books do that as well, and I guess movies do that as well. The cool thing about video games is you get to have that element of choice. Yeah, basically video game storytelling I think is an element of the game creation that is super important and also often overlooked. Here's some appreciation to all my video game writers out there. You're doing good. You're making the games exciting and engaging. Kudos. I really should play more video games, but then also I should learn to manage my time more so that I don't get addicted. I blame the writers. The writers made the game really good and I couldn't stop playing it. If you enjoyed this, come chat in the comments. I also have a live stream on Sunday morning my time. This will be out Saturday my time, so it's basically tomorrow. And I'll link that in the description. Come along, it'll be fun. We'll have some chats. We'll do some fun writing, creativity, sprint things. And yeah, hope you enjoyed it. See you next time. I don't know what else I'm talking about next. You want to feel like the conclusion was worth all the build up. You want to? Ow, my neck. Oh, my eyebrows are so uncomfortable. I just get to run around sword fighting things. This is fun. I can tell my standards are high. And that's the tea.